Connersborough was the site of the second vast Kilner factory. The town is still dotted with the decaying remains of its industrial past. The Kilner plant was demolished long ago. In its place is an environmental public attraction that Jeremy has come across before. I'm fairly convinced that this is where the hideous earth centre is. That would be a cruel irony. The company that faced one of the first environmental lawsuits has now been bulldozed to make way for an earth centre. The entrance to the earth centre is still called Kilner's Bridge. I'm surprised the earth centre hasn't changed the bridge to make it out of rhubarb or something. Something that is kind to the environment. A nice, yeah, I think rhubarb and, and yeast. That'd be a good thing to make a bridge. That wouldn't work, but you know, it'd be kind to the environment. It's not the most beautiful bridge in the world. Not from here, anyway. Nor is it a particularly beautiful bridge from over there, either. It's nice to know that the family has a bridge. As with the other Kilner factories, most of the site of Connorsborough is now just weeds. But here, at least, one building does survive. This house was built in 1864 by Jeremy's great-great-grandfather, Caleb Kilner. For 25 years, Caleb lived here amongst his workers and the smoke of his grimy factory. His obituary, written in 1920, paints a picture of a hard-working, popular employer. This is Caleb Kilner's obituary, the chap who built this house. He said he started out two shillings a week, worked his way up through the family firm until he was set up the Conisborough branch here, and just worked very hard. Everybody loved him. When he died, all the blinds were drawn along the funeral route for the houses. Enormous number of people came to the funeral, including, I noticed some Clarksons, which is interesting. But then, all this stuff is about the church. He was obviously fanatical. In 1899, Caleb moved his family away from the factory to a bigger house overlooking Connorsborough. In here, Ivanhoe Lodge. Ooh, crikey. A creeper covered. Well, he couldn't have had a Range Rover back then. He'd never have got it through here. This, I gather, is where Caleb Kilner came to live after he moved away from the... Um, yeah. So, have you traced the history of the place? Not particularly, no. Really? No. We just know that Caleb lived here and died in 1920. Yeah. Converted the house in the 18, late 1890s, 1890. Converted it from...? Like a cottage-like structure. When the current owner, Peter Skinner, moved in, he discovered a box of Caleb's old photos and documents in the attic. Oh, my God, look at this, what we've got here. This is Caleb Kilner's will. You see how many houses they had. This is what Caleb Kilner, who's only one of them, wasn't he? I mean, this is what he left in his will. 17 houses in Castle Grove Terrace, 13 houses in Dern Street, 11 houses in Don Street, 11 houses in Ouse Street, 13 houses in Trent Terrace, 34 cottages, two houses and two shops in Burcroft, 14 houses in Calder Terrace, 12 houses in Ferry Terrace, 10 cottage villas on the south side of Low Road, known as Kimberley, Pardberg, blah, 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 blah. All the above property being situated at Connorsbury in the county of York, and all his land situated at Bridlington. When Caleb died, age 77, his son George took over the running of the factory and moved into Ivanhoe Lodge. There's a mortgage. George, Ki George killed. I've got a... Why was he taking out a mortgage in 1931 if he'd been left in 1920? Mm. Yeah. About half a million houses. Deeds relating to the 1854 square yards of freehold land with house and other buildings known as Ivanhoe Lodge. He took out a mortgage on this place 11 years after his father died. Did he have a coke habit? <laughs> so in 11 years, he got through the lot. 
So we've narrowed down a culprit at least, haven't we? George. George blew my money. George's 1940 obituary paints a picture of a retiring soul who took no part in community life and liked nothing more than to sit by the fire with a good book. Hardly qualities that make a captain of industry. Under George's management, the firm floundered and his father's fortune dwindled as he struggled to keep the company afloat. Jeremy may have found a culprit, but he still needs to know where George went wrong. One Yorkshire glass company from the Kilner's time has lasted to the present day. If Jeremy can find out how they survived, it might help explain why the Kilners didn't. Well, look, the car's in there. I can't... I was really looking forward to finding out why the Kilners went bust, but I'm afraid it's, it's all over now. I reckon he could jump over. A bit of a run-up. Oh, damn, now look what's happened. Oh. I don't know how you guys are going to get across with the camera and everything. It's... It's Beats and Clark. Hello. John Clark. Hi, Jeremy Clarkson. Nice to meet you. John Clark's family have been manufacturing bottles in Yorkshire for more than 150 years. Kilners were not alone. I mean, there are a number of firms that did go under. In the 1930s, there were 400 glassmakers in this area, and today there are three stroke four. They were caught by, oh, it's hard to say selecting the, the wrong machine for them, but uh, as things turned out, probably they selected the wrong machine. The Kilners may have splashed out on an Owens machine, but it was soon made obsolete by the arrival of bigger and faster machines in the 1920s. The age of mass production had arrived. Not only was the new equipment expensive, but it needed vast factories to operate efficiently, not the numerous small buildings of an old bottle works. So they would have needed to have pulled both their works down mm. and then build new buildings just to put the machines in. Big money. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it, I mean it's, uh, it's enough just to invest in the machinery. Never mind having I mean, to build a building as well. In the new world of modern mass production, a family firm like the Kilners simply lacked the resources to stay in the game. Other glass companies merged to form conglomerates, big enough to tear down their old factories and start again. You need to look at that photograph of George Kilner and know he wasn't going to be the sort of man who was going to start again. George struggled on until 1937. Then, after four generations and 93 years, Kilner Glass closed its doors for the last time. But for the Kilner Jar, the story was far from over. The trademark was bought by one of the new conglomerates and production continued, reaching its peak during the Second World War and becoming a kitchen icon, indispensable to a generation of housewives. Before I go back to the South again, I do want to know what this man in Cheshire is doing with my patent, well, my trademark. What is historically and rightfully mine? Why has he got it? What's he going to do with it? And will he give it to me or will I have to punch him to get it out of him? 